guys, I'm Matthew Ivanhoe. I am the founder of The Cultivated Collector in New Canaan, Connecticut. We specialize in investment grade cars, automobiles of distinction, and we're gonna have a lot of fun today. Come on inside, let's go. Welcome inside, guys. So, we have a lot of really, really special cars to cover here. Stuff that, you know, one of ones, one of threes, one of fives. But we're gonna start with a car that is really near and dear to my heart. This is a 1992 Venturi 400 Trophy. There are only 73 of these cars that were produced. And this was a fascinating car, race car, but also legal for the street. The first Gentleman's Challenge series that was executed before Ferrari Challenge, before Porsche Cup. And these cars, they weigh 2,425 pounds wet. They make 408 horsepower, which was quite conservative. They really make more than that. And it is positively ballistic to drive. I call it the French F40, and with good reason, because this car has a better power to weight ratio than an F40. It is colossally exciting. This particular car raced in the, uh, raced in the Gentleman Series, raced in the, raced in the Trophy Series. After that, it was driven occasionally at track days, and by 1996, its racing days were over. It was put away, and it stayed away until 2015 when it was brought out again and fully recommissioned so that it could engage in historic racing, which you see it has all of the, all the, the evidence of that there. And what's really, really special about this car is that not only is this thing highly competitive, incredible to look at, amazing to drive. It is a car that you can drive to the track, win, and then drive home. So this thing really is near and dear to my heart. I first fell in love with Venturi's as a kid playing, playing Gran Turismo, playing Gran Turismo 2. They had the 400 GT in it and I was just, I was fixated. It was, it was so cool, so different, so special. And I had to have one. There are four cars in the US. I've brought in three of the four. And this is just the, the, the Yako livery, the, the, just the history of this particular car. It's never been in an accident. It's, you know, which is very unusual for a race car. Just really makes this thing incredibly special. And the one thing I will say is that just sitting here and hearing about a car is two dimensional. We're gonna go three dimensional. Let's go take this thing for a ride. Fastest car in the world. That's pretty much all we need to say about the car that we're looking at right here. This is a 1993 Jaguar XJ220. And when it debuted, it knocked the F40 off the throne. Not by a little bit, by a lot. Corrected, this car did 218 miles an hour to the F40's 201. This thing absolutely smoked it. And not only, not only was it the fastest car in the world, it's breathtaking to look at. It is incredible to drive. It is a physically very large car, but it is, it drives like a small car. It's light, it's nimble, it's exciting. It handles brilliantly. And even by modern car standards, this thing is ballistic. It is it is melt your face off fast. It, you know, line it up next to any, insert modern supercar here, I don't care what it is, this thing is holding its own. And if you look at period videos of this against other, you know, other supercars of the era, Bugatti EB110 Super Sport, Pagani Zondas, things that came later, this thing still, despite being older, trounces them. This car to me is one of the best values 
in the supercar world today. These are, in my opinion, criminally undervalued and poised, and, and poised to grow. They're, they're, they're so special, they're incredibly rare, less than 300 examples were made. And they still sell for less than what they sold for brand new in 1992, which is, which is crazy to me. And it's, I've, I've, had, I've had just about 10 of these, and every single one still excites me. The example that, that, we, that we're looking at right here is the finest example I've ever laid my eyes on. This car has less than 450 kilometers from new, and it absolutely reads that way. You look at the bolster, you look at the paint, you look at, you look at the engine bay, everything about it screams authenticity and, and lets you know that, that this car was in a collection where it was cherished and loved. That's where I, I bought it out of Switzerland. And I took one look at this car and I said, yep, this is real. And it's absolutely breathtaking. It's unbelievable. It's documented, it's serviced, it's the best of the best. And I couldn't be more proud to have this car sitting here. All right, I don't think this one needs any introduction. You all know what this is. Ferrari Enzo. The Ferrari supercar line began with the 288 GTO, then continued with the F40, F50, and then the Enzo. And the Enzo was such an impressive, exciting entry in the, in the supercar line. It's not, I mean, not only does it have the speed, it, it ha, it not only does it have the handling, not only does it have the technology, the thing that really gets me about this car is the style. You know, this car, I feel as though, if this car had never been introduced in 2002 when it was originally introduced, and had the La Ferrari never been introduced as well, had Ferrari just never made a supercar in between now and then, and this car were introduced today, I think it would still have every bit as much shock and awe now as it did back then. I think that Time has been very kind to the Enzo. Admittedly, when the Enzo first came out and I saw it in pictures, I was not a fan. Then when I saw it in person, I got it. And with time, Ken Okuyama, who is the, the, the chief designer on this car, his design just, it, it is, this is such a fine wine. It's maturing so well. And the noise, the look, the feel, it's, it's absolutely incredible, and it's rare. It's, it, it's, it's everything that you want your Ferrari to be. Last, but certainly not least, in this supercar lineup right here, 1993 Chupin 962CR. So, Porsche introduces the 956 to the Group C sports racing world and dominates, absolutely obliterates the competition. The 962 was a successor that basically just implemented a few tweaks to the 956 and continued to dominate. This car, the 962, the 956, 962, you know, twin sibling pairing, is the most dominant sports racing prototype of all time. And this right here is a street legal version of that car. This is one of six, this is the final car produced, and it's the only one in the United States. And this car differs from the others in that this is the only one that has the proper Porsche 962C nose, side pods, and most importantly, it has the full fat 2.65 liter water cooled cylinder head, air cooled block, Group C motor, which makes 600 horsepower on low boost, 800 horsepower on high boost. The car weighs right around 2,250 pounds. This car, if unleashed, would have had no issue going toe to toe with the McLaren F1 for fastest car. This car today is still a mind-bendingly fast car. Mind-bendingly exciting. For me, this car, little kid, I would see 
pictures of Dowers and pictures of shoe pans, and it was all I could think about. It, the, the idea of driving a race car on the street, to me, is one of the coolest things that you can do. And this car is the fulfillment of that dream by taking the most successful sports racing prototype of all time and driving it on the street. What could possibly be better than that? And I will give you a little bit of a sneak on that one and we'll show you the business end of the car just so you can see how serious this car is. It is full, full race. It is, it is absolutely unquestionably a race car that has been lightly massaged just to be barely street legal and that's it. And that to me is just perfection. Like if you look, if you look at a 962C race car and you look at this, you go, I know exactly what I'm looking at. It's the exact same thing, except for the fact that you look down here and you see catalytic converters and you see massive mufflers and this whole hood thing hinge. I mean, those are literally the only concessions to streetability that are on this car. Though the, the fascinating thing about it is that it actually is easy to drive. It's actually civilized. It's the clutch, the clutch isn't heavy. It's sync, you know, it's a, it's a synchronized gearbox. It's the steering is, is not, is not super heavy. It's, it doesn't pound you over bumps with the exception of the fact that you're driving a car that's, you know, probably two and a half inches off the ground. Other than that, it's actually very easy to drive. It's typical Porsche stuff. So it's, it's, it's really a remarkable car. And this, this thing also, which probably be on record, this thing brand new in 1993 was $1.9 million. All right, guys, we're gonna rewind a little bit now. This is pre-war and this car, this is a 1937 BMW 328 Roadster, the most successful sports racer of the pre-war era. And this car, it absolutely blows your mind with how modern it drives. It drives better than many, than many 1950s cars. It's, it is, and the reason why is because the technology in this car is, it's all post-war stuff. Independent suspension, hemispherical combustion chambers. I mean, this thing, it's light, it's fast, it's balanced, it handles. It is absolutely remarkable to drive. This particular example is also very special. This is the fourth example produced, which makes it the earliest car in North America and in Europe. This car also was a race car. It was an NSKK car, very successful car. Its best finish was second at the sports car race at the Nürburgring in 1937. This car, then its history goes dark because of the start of World War II. Then an American, an American colonel found the car and claimed it as a war prize, brought it back to the United States. This car stayed in the US from 1952 until 2007, when this car was discovered completely unrestored in its original color, which you see today, it was taken to the UK where it received a completely uncompromising restoration, which just oozes authenticity. It then raced at Goodwood. It won the Brooklyn's Trophy three years running. It's won pretty much every single Concorde. It's, it's won an award at every single Concorde event it goes to. It is a numbers matching body, engine, and frame, which is very unusual for a 328, especially for a race car. And this thing, again, it, it's not just the way it looks, which is ravishing, it's the way it drives, which is mind blowing. And this thing, this thing is just, it's, it's superlative, it's absolutely incredible. So if you were to look back and think about what, who was going to be the dominant sports car manufacturer in Italy in the post-war era. In 1947, if you were a betting person, you wouldn't have thought of Ferrari. Cisitalia is who you would have thought of. And this car right here 
is the car that wrote, that wrote, really wrote the Chisitalia story. The 202 Coupe, from a design perspective, absolutely tells that story. This car, this car tells their story on the racing side, which was every bit, if not more important than the road car side. So this car, the 202 Spider Milli Milia. This car, not this exact car, but a 202 Spider Milli Milia was driven by Tazio Nuvolari in the 1947 Milli Milia to a second overall and first in class finish. And while they may not sound super remarkable, the fact of the matter is, is that Nuvolari was racing against a twin supercharged eight cylinder Alfa Romeo. And this car is a 1.1 liter naturally aspirated four cylinder. Now you might ask yourself, how did this happen? I mean, Nuvolari is a great driver, don't get me wrong, and drove what many consider to be the greatest David and Goliath race there ever was. But this car really heralded a new approach to car making. This car was all about, it was about aerodynamics. It was about lightweight. It was about chassis dynamics. It was about the suspension. It was about the entire package. And when you drive this car, you see exactly what they were thinking. This car to drive is just sublime. Is it supremely fast? No, it's not. Is it immensely rewarding, incredibly balanced, ridiculously dynamic? Absolutely. It is amazing to drive. Looking down over those louvers is just beyond romantic. It sounds great. It's quick. It's exciting. It's just, it's just an incredible machine. They only made 26 Spider Milli Millias. It, of those 26, it is believed that only nine survive with their original bodies, frames, and engines. This is one of those nine. And that makes this car a really, really significant and special piece of automotive history. We're gonna rewind again. 1946. Italy is a bombed out wreck, literally rubble. And out of that rubble emerges this. This is a Cisitalia 202 Cassone Aerodynamica. This is a one-off. This, this is the only car that exists. And this exact car finished third overall and second in class at the 1947 Milli Milia, which was the first Milli Milia that they ran after World War II. And this car, this was a team car, so this was a Chisitalia team car. This car really heralded a new era in design because this car was an aerodynamic study. It was being constantly tweaked and massaged and refined and you can actually see this in the historical photos of this car. Every single race, there is a little tweak that they, that they massaged into this car to refine it, not only, not only to refine the overall shape, but also to refine the car for the exact race that they were attending. So it was one of the earliest applications of aerodynamics for for the actual race itself, which while it was a crude and rather rudimentary implementation, makes this car ridiculously significant. So not only was this, not only is this car incredibly significant because of its Milli Milia history, it is also incredibly significant because of what it represents in terms of automotive design. And this car is, featherweight light. It, I've never had it on scales, but if I had to guess, it's probably about 1,200 pounds. Only 1.1 liter four cylinder, but when you have that little weight, you don't need a lot of power to move yourself around efficiently. And the balance and the dynamics are just amazing. It is so exciting. It is so thrilling to drive. The, no, the, the noise it makes, just, 
you, you have no doubt or question that you are in a purpose-built machine. And just to be able to sit in the same seat that, in the, in the same car that went into battle and achieved such greatness all those years ago is an experience unlike anything else and uh, one that I highly urge people to, people to seek if you have the means. This is a 1952 Asuka MT4 1100 2AD. And what you are looking at is the most competitive car that you could buy for the most competitive category for race cars in Italy in the late 1940s and early 1950s. This car was beyond competitive. When the Maserati brothers left their namesake company and they decided that they were going to start a new company, they wanted to make the most successful race cars that money could buy in the most competitive classes in Italy at the time. And they succeeded wildly. I mean, if you didn't own an Asuka and you were competing in 1100, 1350 or 1500cc you know, racing in Italy in the late 40s through the 50s, you really, you weren't anyone. I mean, these cars were wildly successful. And this car is no exception. This car, 28 period races under its belt. It's the intersection of the car's most significant finish at the most significant race was its finish in the 1953 Mille Miglia, which is the livery that it wears today. And just look at it. I mean, the livery is just the coolest. And what's really special about this particular car and really means a lot to me whenever, whether, whether I'm buying a car for me or I'm buying a car for inventory or I'm buying a car for a client, is authenticity. So of all the Asuka MT4s produced, of which there were less than 100 ever produced, because they were all race cars, a lot of, they, they all led generally very hard lives. They were crashed, their motors were blown up. I mean, all sorts of, you know, all sorts of things happened to them. So of those cars, there are really only about 20 or 25 of them that you, that are righteous, that you, that you actually want to own, that still have their original bodies, original engines, frames, etc. This is one of those cars. This car has just, it, is, it just oozes authenticity. It's, it is not only, not only is it beautiful to look at, it just dances with you on the road. It also, even though it only has an 1100cc engine, it punches so far above its weight. I mean, it, an equivalent Alfa Romeo would, it would have a, you know, a, a 1600 cc engine just based you know the horsepower and the feel of it they were so over engineered they were so well balanced and this car just just the feeling of a 1950s sports racing barquetta is unlike anything that, that you can that you can achieve and it's one of those experiences that one should have if one is if one is a dedicated car collector and you know, I don't think that we would be doing you guys any justice if we didn't get out there and have a little bit of fun. So let's do that. I always say that, you know, a car that, if there were such a thing as a perfect car, we'd have a washing machine. Cars are fun because of their, because of their flaws and their imperfections. And, Race cars have so much character, and this car just ha this car just oozes character. You throw it into a turn, and just it just it just dances. The noise, the feel—I mean, just everything about it. It's and what's also amazing is this car's chassis. Like you look underneath it, and the the way with the way they design this chassis is so so advanced, so good. It is remarkably stiff. The dynamics make it, it just, it's super predictable and neutral, just a wonderful enchanted car to drive. So it's, it's all, it's awesome, but, uh, but 
yeah, don't, don't, don't take my word for it. You'll, you'll see once we get out there. It's, um, it's a lot of fun to drive. So when people talk about race car for the street, you know, that sounds nice. It's, it's, it's cool. This actually is a race car for the street because this car is based on the Jaguar XJR9, which won Le Mans in 1988, and the XJR12, which won Le Mans in 1990. And it's just, it's evident throughout. I mean, it has the exact same tub that the car had. It has this beautifully designed carbon fiber body that was done by Peter Stevens, who designed the McLaren F1. It has this thumping six liter V12 engine by Jaguar, all alloy, dry sump, race stuff. They only made 28 of these XJR15s. Of those cars, the vast majority of them were blue. There was a very, very, there, there was a specific blue that, that they wore. There were only three XJR15s that were born in yellow. This is one of those three. The other thing that makes this car particularly special is that of the 28 road cars, there is only one that was born with the six speed racing gearbox. This is that car. So what you're looking at is really a one of one. This is the only yellow, only race gearbox. And that takes an experience that is already incredible and, and really takes it over the top. I mean, the racing gearbox completely transforms the car. The closest thing that you can get to driving a Group C or GT1 car on the road, it is, it was impossibly expensive. In 1991, this car was near as makes no difference, $1 million. And the second you drive it, you know why. If you've ever driven a true thoroughbred race car, and by thoroughbred, I mean a car that was born to be a race car, then you will know exactly what it is you're driving when you get behind the wheel of this car. It is, it, it has a, raw, visceral feel, unlike anything that you can drive that is a normal production car. This is, this car is the alpha and the omega in analog brutality. And we're gonna go have some fun.
Well, that was a lot of fun. We drove some fantastic cars, looked at some incredible stuff, learned some things along the way. Thank you so much for coming along, you guys. We'll catch you next time.